How are you doing, brother? Good. Do you like salmon? I love salmon. We're gonna do an old school salmon dish with home brewed soy. We're gonna put it on crispy rice. We're gonna serve it with some dumplings. I'm really, really excited. Look at this. This is beautiful. When you're looking for a piece of fish, you're like, what are you looking for? So for salmon, I'm looking for the biggest loin. Because when I clean it up and break it down, I want to have a nice big three and a half inch slice because we're going to be doing sashimi. And you know the truth is, I don't even like salmon. Oh, really? But I love fish when you take a good piece of fish and you make it better with doing lots of interesting things. So we're going to cure it. So it's going to take away the greasiness. It's going to firm up the loin. It's going to pop the color. And then when we hit it with a torch, we're going to give it texture. And you're going to have that aroma of the salmon. Now I'm down with it. I like that one right there. See how thick that loin yep. is right there? Because that's what we're going to be eating on. Perfect. We'll take the whole thing. When you touch fish, you are doing old traditions. You're doing things like your grandparents did. You're doing things like their grandparents did. That's why fish is so special to me, because it represents my Japanese heritage. Thank you very much. This Thanks is beautiful. Lot, Have a good day. Can I open it? Yeah. It's like Christmas. We have this salmon, whole filet of salmon. So we're probably looking at just under three pounds of Aura King. Aura King being number one grade, being what you want to do when you go into your fishmonger saying, what's sushi grade or what's number one grade? Here's the head, here's the loin tail, here's the belly for what we're doing today. We're going to concentrate just on the loin. It has skin on. I have them leave it on because I like to trim it down myself. You can ask a fishmonger to trim it down. And, and you can also ask them to take out the pin bones. Yep, and we had them take out the pin bones just so we didn't have to work that yep. hard. So this is easy to break this down. I'm going to break it down into a saku, which is about the width of my hand. We're going to go down. I'm going to cut right through the loin and the belly. So your knife here looks a little different than most chef knives at home. So this is a Japanese knife exclusively used for cutting fish. It's a Yanagi knife. A Japanese knife is sharp on one side. A Western knife is sharp yeah, on both sides. Double bevel, single bevel, yep. I love to start with this one. So again, skin, bloodline, loin, belly. A little bit of extra fiber right in the middle. So I'm gonna scoop the loin out, yep. scoop the belly out. And then I'm gonna flip it yep. before I get to the end so I can trim off and I don't get that extra fiber right yep. there. So there's the loin. I'm gonna turn it around. I'm gonna go on the other side of the fiber. Where did you learn how to do this? So I did everything I could on my own. I watched all the YouTube videos. I bought the sushi kits. I took cooking classes and then I hit the wall. And then I realized that it was really important to me to identify with my Japanese American heritage. And I thought, what better way than to take a really interesting tool like cooking to kind of tell my story. I literally make cured salmon so that people can learn about the Japanese American experience. Just like having a restaurant or cooking for a group of 10 people, that's 10 people that are on the same page with you that accept you for who you are, accept you for being a marginalized group. We all have that one private story where a kid in eighth grade made sure he was gonna make me feel marginalized and yep. call me a Jap yep. and make me know the pain and the sting of you're different and you're not the majority. And I knew from that point on that the world would see me as different. I knew that I looked different. I knew that I had a different story. My story is that I'm half Japanese, half German. My grandmother was a chef when she came over from Japan to California in 1917, and she ran a restaurant as a single parent with five kids all the way up until the war. Women didn't do that in the 20s and 30s. Women didn't do that, and women weren't successful, but yes. she was. Let alone like in America as an immigrant. You know, exactly, so. exactly. So I literally do this so I can tell you and talk about my grandmother. That's amazing. And I've told you this before, I don't love salmon, mm -hmm. but I love good fish. Mm -hmm. So take salmon, we're gonna cure it. Okay. Curing means that we're going to lightly put salt covering the whole thing, two hours and 45 minutes. Not two hours and 50 minutes, and not two hours and 40 minutes. Where, where exactly. did you learn that timing? It comes from my master teacher, Katsuya. You follow the recipe, he's yeah. been doing it for decades. You don't tinker, you don't, don't, you don't, don't tinker. Question. Don't you know? question the master. He taught me 
everything I needed to do so that I would celebrate old techniques and methods. So watch. The higher I hold this up, the more it shatters over the loin. And because you don't want it to be too heavy because it will actually like burn the fish. You want your protein to be pristine. So I feel that's good. And it's just, it's the easiest thing ever. And bam, you're done. So then fast forward two hours, 45 minutes. I'm gonna rinse these off a good couple times. Rinsing is critical. Do a quick dry, loin. So we, loin, we cured it, belly, rinse it off. off. Yep. Dry it out. Yep. Yep. And now we're ready to go with it. Yep. Literally, it's that easy to cure fish. We're ready to roll. Is there a special way you want to slice this? I'm going to start on the bias and I'm just going to go real thin. Everything that people criticize salmon about, mm -hmm. curing takes care of it. It's greasy. It gets rid of it. Mm -hmm. It's not firm enough. It firms it up. Yeah, you can totally tell. It's just the texture of the fish is different. In my opinion, nobody should eat raw, uncured salmon. It's just too rich for most people. So we have all that sliced up salmon. What we want to do is build it. We're going to put crispy rice. We're going to put a slice of salmon on it. We're going to brush it with the home brewed soy. Okay. We're going to serve it with some dumplings. So let's move some of these over here. So we just sear, you sear those off. Yep. Yep. Yes, it has regular sushi rice. It has the vinegar, sugar, salt in it. We dip it in soy sauce to give it a little bit of salt. What you're gonna notice is the salmon's almost like a bedspread on yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so that you see more salmon than you see anything else. That's exactly what we're going for. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah, it looks great. So here's the deal, I would just eat it like that. Yep. You think that's good? How about if we put a little bit of homemade soy sauce okay. on it? So it's really gonna enhance everything in the fish without overwhelming it. And then, the most fun? Yep, this is where everyone lives for. So what I'm not gonna do is move it all around because we're not cooking the fish. We're giving it a light sear to bring out all the oil and give it a little char to add another level of texture to it. So I'll do this one. And that helps caramelize that soy also. Yep. Exactly. It's just awesome. I'll finish these three and then we'll dress it up. All I do is put a smudge of wasabi on top and a pinch of scallions. So here we are. Everything's finished. It's simple. This is so simple because there's like not a lot of ingredients in it, you know? And it's pristine, it's yeah. pure. Yep, and just really good technique. Just using great technique and it looks delicious. It's all about the technique. Let's plate it up. I don't have many prized possessions, but this is one of them. So this is my grandmother's plate from the restaurant circa 1920-ish. Wow, yes. tell us a little bit more about it. So it's, I don't know if it's a great plate. I just know that this is the plate that she would make plates of food and share it with the neighbors. And so to know that my grandmother in her restaurant in Sacramento, California in the 20s and 30s was making food and plating it up literally as we're doing it today, really is, it's almost an emotional thing. And that's why I like to share it. So let me go ahead and build it up with some seared salmon. Do you know why I use purple cabbage? Uh, no. All of my elders are gone. But they all said grandma put something crunchy as a garnish mm -hmm. under the dumplings. They're all gone. I'll never know what that was. My dad could never remember it. There are no written recipes. But I really do use purple cabbage under it for the crunch. Yeah. But it's also that pop of color. Every day, every dish, I get that gentle reminder of grandma. Every single aspect of everything on this plate, including the plate, is telling part of the story, the part of the story that my grandmother, my aunts and uncles, my dad were in war camps in Northern California, lost everything, lost a business, lost a house, everything, to come out four and a half years and start all over. There's a Japanese term called goman, which means, okay, you're out of the camp, get over it. Don't be a victim. Smile and move on. Well, you know what? They did. Yeah. Everybody moved on. They didn't talk about the war camp in my family until I was like 16 years old when I'm like, no, 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 I need to know more. Help me understand. I mean, they really just moved on. And so this is my way to, again, to talk about and bring all those things forward. And that's kind of what I live in standby, actually, to break the Goman history, tell the story, tell as much information, tell it through food, tell it on a great platter and everything like that, and keep it simple, but keep it real. God, this looks so delicious. I'm so excited to try this. <laughs>
Enjoy that salmon, cured, seared, crispy rice cake. Mm -hmm. I, I love that salmon. One of the, my favorite things about it is that quick sear at the end. Every step has the flavor. There, there, there's a reason for putting the uh, crispy rice in the soy. Like every step has a little flavor. Even just that little wasabi, there's that little spice, that little kick. Just a little bit, just a little bit. Great food that can tell a great story really is interesting. How did you get so captivated by this whole idea of like telling stories through food? You know, I've been doing food for like 10 years prior to going to school. It was in 1996 that my mom called me home from work. I cooked for her. I cooked for her a pork chop. But she called me home to spend time together doing something normal like eating. That's all she wanted. She didn't eat the pork chop either. And she died a few hours later. But that's when I understood what food could do. What a great thing that she had the courage to ask for a pork chop that day and I could spend that moment with her. Food, there's no other, I can't think of one other tool like this that can do that kind of powerful healing, that kind of powerful relationship interaction with your mom in her last day. And I'm forever grateful for that. There you go. So then on these, I would just butterfly these and you'd get one portion, but everything would be used. In, in, the, in the cooking world, we just call it our snacky snack. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no snacky snacks. We want 100% yield. There's a couple bucks there, so we, you know, no snacky snacks.